So, you've finally decided to live full-time in your RV, or at least a good portion of the year, as opposed to just taking it out for the occasional weekend and once a year vacation. Those are two very different things. And so today in this video, we're gonna talk about what it's like to live full-time in an RV, or at least a good portion of the year, and what kind of costs you can expect to see doing that. And when we talk about costs, we're not just talking about financial costs. We're talking about the emotional cost, uh, privacy cost, and just overall well-being of your family's cost. And it's not just, you know, gas and insurance and things like that. you got to think about you're going to be paying to park somewhere every single night unless you're boondocking in a Walmart parking lot. But you've also got Wi-Fi considerations. You know, you're going to need some sort of Wi-Fi. And while most campgrounds say they offer Wi-Fi, most don't offer very good Wi-Fi. So you're going to want to think about those kinds of costs as well. And we're going to get into all of that in this video. One thing I like to talk about the most is the personal cost. So each person in a living space of this size is gonna have to give up a little bit of privacy. That means making a routine schedule, you know. In the evenings, we tend to go to our room with Layla around 8, 30, 9 p.m. So the older girls have approximately two hours in the evening to themselves. And it's important to point out, in case you haven't seen our previous videos, we've got three daughters. <laughs> Layla's our toddler. And then we've got two older daughters that are in middle school. And so right now, all five of us are in this RV right here. It's a Newmar Bay Star. We're all in here right now. We, we're going to be traveling for well over a month at this point. We're not living full time in it yet, but we are traveling extensively in it. So that's what this video is. The, our information is based on is our extensive living together in this thing. Another cost I'd like to point out is scheduling costs. Now we tend to, you know, have our Monday through Friday educational times, but sometimes Jeff has an extra project he has to work on that requires us being outside of the RV, which means I have to get creative on where all three of our children do their schoolwork as well as just enjoying the sunlight while we can. Today, for instance, we went to the pavilion at the pool at Ocean Grove Resort in St. Augustine, Florida. My favorite aspect of going to a different area of the park is that that gives us an opportunity to meet other people who are traveling on the road. We need to take those mental breaks. You know, I have people my age I can speak to. Layla, who's two and a half, almost three years old. Usually there's a toddler or two running around as well. The big girls, they're in their teen years. They're indifferent to everything and they're begrudgingly doing their homework. But today, they loved being by the pool while doing their homework. There's also a restaurant here so they were able to order some lunch and continue out their work the rest of the day. Now, in terms of the nuts and bolts financial costs, of course, the, the first thing you're going to have is gasoline. We have an 80 gallon tank in this thing, so you can bet, you know, it costs a lot of money to fill this thing up, well over $100. I don't actually ever let it get down below uh, a quarter tank, and most of the time I prefer to fill it up when it's a little uh, less than half a tank, and I'm still putting anywhere from $70 to $90 in it at a pop. Of course, the gas mileage and how much gas you use and the size of your tank is going to vary depending upon what kind of RV you have. But right out of the gate, expect to have a lot of money set aside for your gas budget. And of course, uh, RVs are not known for their great gas mileage. This thing probably gets between six and eight miles per gallon. If you're towing a vehicle behind yours, you can expect to get even less. But if you've got a Class C and you're not towing anything, maybe you'll get as much as 10 miles per gallon. But that's got to be the first thing you factor in. Another thing to look at is intimacy cost. Intimacy as in, and to me, I see you. <laughs> but what it's I'm an talking inside Mike <laughs> But more importantly, it's taking time to talk to your children about when you need your specific alone time. This could be for romantic intimacy or just taking time for one another to have a cup of coffee together. But if you're traveling in an RV as a couple, and especially if you've got kids or anyone else in there with you, finding time for romantic time is important. That's a big part of our marriage and it's an important part of our marriage. And it can be a little hard to do in this thing when you're all cooped up in there together. So figuring out a way to make that work, scheduling that time is definitely important. Fortunately for us, we have all girls. So I was able to sit together with our two oldest daughters who are 12 and 13 and explain a very, very modest explanation that, you know, 
at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, they would need to take Layla to the playground or the pool area on their own. We'd provide snacks and whatnot, give us about an hour. We would text them when we were finished and meet up whenever they were done. No need to explain further than that. They don't want details. I don't want to provide details. But it leaves the doorway to open communication on your wants and needs. And they have a clear understanding that if they have wants and needs, that those can be met as well. Now, the next big technical expense of living full time in an RV, of course, is going to be the campground you're parked at. Like I said, unless you're boondocking somewhere and you're not going to want to do that for any length of time because you're not going to have full hookups. So knowing that you need full hookups to live comfortably year round in an RV or at least for a good portion of the year, you're going to want to stay at a campground. The cheapest campground we've stayed at so far on this trip was $39 a night. It did have full hookups, but not much else. The next level above that is kind of a mid-range. They might have a playground, they might have a swimming pool, and that's gonna be 50 to $60 a night. And then you've got full-blown RV resorts, like the one we're <laughs> staying at right now, which have a lot of bells and whistles. There's a restaurant, there's a pool, there's a hot tub, there's a playground, there's a dog park. There's lots to see and do. The beach is walking distance. Yeah, and we're paying a hundred <laughs> bucks a night here. So I would say on average, expect to spend at least $50 a night uh, for your campground and that's going to be for however long your, your, your trip in your RV is. 50 bucks a night minimum. One thing I like to take a really close look at is every place we visit are fun, fun family activities for us to all get involved in. In St. Augustine, for instance, it is the oldest American city in the United States of America, founded in 1565. Who knew? <laughs> so we'll be exploring lots of history while we're here, but we also enjoy going to zoos and museums, beaches, lakes, anything that the town has to offer, because honestly, education is indoor and outdoor. The other expense that you're going to have to think about is food. Now. Our RV has a pretty nice little kitchen inside. It's got a three burner stove, refrigerator, sink, microwave, which also doubles as a convection oven. There's lots that we can cook in there. But living in this thing ex for an extended period of time, you're gonna get tired of eating in there. You're gonna get tired of cooking. There's gonna be days where you don't wanna make all three meals in your RV. And so you're gonna think, have to think about not only buying groceries for this thing, um, but also the occasionally eating out just to kind of break up the monotony. So I would expect to spend, what do you think, at, at least probably 200 bucks a week? I feel like- For a family of five, I should say. I feel like our grocery budget has gone down, whereas our eating out and fun budget has come up. Just to kind of balance out again, we're driving in our RV, we're living in our RV, our school works in the RV, our you know work works in the RV, our rest times in the RV. And so where we have a home that's over 2,500 feet in Wimberley, it's a little bit squeezed in a 400 square foot RV. So we tend to get out a little bit more than I think most would. But that doesn't mean you can't get creative. You can cook outdoors, you can have a crock pot, you can go to the restaurants on site, you know, keep it simple. I would say for a family of five, expect to probably spend closer to 300 a week, unless you're being super frugal and just eating ramen and microwave dinners. Um, but that's a major expense, of course, is your food in the RV. And nobody snacks more like teenagers. So of course our budget is adhered to having basically four adults living inside of a home. <laughs> and a toddler who wants to do drive-by grazing 24 seven. <laughs> of course, the other things that you don't always think about in terms of expense uh, are maintenance on the RV. Um, if you're doing a lot of driving like we're doing on this trip, uh, we need to figure out where to do an oil change, for instance, because we've, we've probably gone about 3,000 miles since we left and we need to get an oil change because we're probably going to put another 1,000 miles on it before we get back home again. And oil changes in an RV are not like they are in a car. Uh, we're looking at probably spending at least $150 to do an oil change on this thing. Um, and that's just one of the maintenance things, you know, we're going to need to get the tires checked and tires rotated and things like that as well. So you got to plan for those kind of expenses too. Now, if you're just driving somewhere and staying put indefinitely in one place, 
that's not going to be a top consideration. But just for your own brain stimulation, you probably want to move around at least two to four times a month just to kind of keep it interesting. Something else I like to point out is in regards to getting out and about in the town is zoo memberships, museum memberships. There are several different types of memberships you can obtain. There's a Smithsonian membership, there's an affiliate program for science museums as well as history museums, and a zoological coordination. We bought a zoo membership for the Oklahoma City Zoo, which gave us half price into the Atlanta Zoo, which is only one of nine zoos in America to have panda bears. And not just your red pandas, but the giant pandas. And that's something you don't always think about is, you know, zoo memberships, museum memberships, or even memberships to places like Six Flags. If you get a membership one place, it can probably get you in for free or half price at dozens of places across the country. We have a Six Flags membership, for instance, and we bought it at the one in San Antonio, which is closest to where we live. But the next time we go to Dallas, for instance, we can use it there. Uh, there was one in Atlanta that we, we didn't get a chance to go to on this trip even though we did go to Atlanta but we could have gone there for free using that so if you that's a very good way to keep expenses down rather than paying full price every time you go to a museum zoo or amusement park is get look into those memberships and see this is what they call reciprocal see what the reciprocal places are around the country that will accept that either at a discounted rate or completely for free and usually those pay for themselves within two to three visits so it really is an investment and it's a year-long investment. It's good for 365 days from date of purchase. So one thing I want to go a little bit deeper on is Wi-Fi. We're a family of five. In our RV, we have four laptops and four cell phones. And my wife and our two older daughters are all doing school throughout the week on their laptops. So having a way to connect to the internet is really, really important to us. As part of that, before we bought our RV, we made the decision to switch cell phone providers. We were with Metro PCS, which had, uh, is on the T-Mobile network, which is not bad, but it has somewhat limited coverage around the US. AT&T has by far the biggest network. Now, there are some complaints and, and issues that people have with AT&T in terms of billing and customer service, and I think some of those are valid based on our experience, but they have the biggest network nationwide of any cell phone provider, and they also allow tethering on their phones. In other words, you can use your mobile phone as a hotspot device. Metro PCS didn't allow that. So we made the decision to switch. We were paying about $100 a month for four cell phones with Metro PCS. We're paying about double that now with AT&T, but all four of our phones get 30 gigabytes a month of mobile hotspot data. And that's allowing us to connect to the internet when we don't otherwise have a good way to connect. So if we're in a campground with terrible uh, Wi-Fi, which is somewhat common, uh, we can connect using our mobile hotspots. Um, or if we're on the road, if I'm driving and our daughters need to get on to do a Zoom class, they can just use their phone as a, as a mobile hotspot. So that's another expense to think about is what kind of, how are you, how badly do you need Wi-Fi? Can you use your phone as a mobile hotspot? And if not, what's it gonna cost to upgrade so that you can use it as a mobile hotspot device? Kind of covers all of the major expenses of living full-time in an RV. The only other things that we didn't really get into were winterizing your RV if you happen to be parking somewhere in the uh, a really frigid winter. But we will be doing a video on winterizing an RV, so look for that on our channel coming up. If you have anything you think we've missed, please leave us a comment down below. But otherwise, we'll see you in the next video. See ya.